seated. Acts 13. I don't remember. Uh, it's been a while since we studied. Two, two Sunday nights to begin. Yeah, because we missed. Uh, we had Christmas Eve, but we didn't study it. We had New Year's Eve, we didn't study it. Uh, Acts 13, verses 1 through 4. If you're ready for the Word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? amen. You can be, uh, you can remain, remain seated. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which they have been called. And having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and there they sailed to the island of Cyprus beautiful island in Cyprus. Uh, so let's review. When we last studied in Acts, we were looking at, uh, this section is called Satanic Opposition to a Spirit-Filled Church. And remember, we're looking here at a church. What is a Spirit-Filled Church? A healthy church. A healthy church, okay. Others? Spirit filled simply means to be huh? obedient. obedient. Spirit controlled, is that okay? And what that means is that you have a church that majors on the Word of God, not on programs or other side attractions. And because of its centric purpose, a church like this can effectively impact the world. And we have begun then to look at four things that are featured in the church that is able to reach out to the world effectively. Number one, sound familiar? It has spiritual men. God has always placed a high premium on spiritual leadership. And we look at the calling of these either early leaders of the church at Antioch. And we examine the words of apostles and prophets and teachers and preachers. Okay? And then we saw as a second feature of a church that reaches the world. It has spiritual men that are led to do spiritual ministry. And I hope that you remember that we looked at the, at the word in the text where it says that they ministered to the Lord and all that that meant. It meant that all their service all that we do in the ministry is a sacrificial offering to God. In fact, as a Christian, all we do in our life, we should see as an offering to the Lord, okay? So I want to expound upon that thought just a little bit. Malachi 1.13, if you want to turn to Malachi, the last book of the, uh, the Old Testament just before the 400 year <laughs> period of silence. Malachi 1.13. I want to talk about the offerings of Israel. What they were offering up to God. And you know the people of Israel had by this time the people of Israel have gone down the drain if you will spiritually. They are really in a place where they don't even want religion. And so in verse 13 it says the prophet speaking he says you also say, oh, what a weariness. You know what that means? That religious stuff, it's a drag. This is God's chosen people, okay? The religion that's going on in the temple, we're sick and tired of that. And it continues and you sneer at it. For them, religion had become a waste of their time and their effort. They went through the motions. And what does he say? And you brought that which was <clears throat> stolen, lame, and sick. What are you supposed? Listen. What are you supposed to bring to God? 
The best. The best. There you go. For the big beef. The best. They were bringing the lame and sick, and God rhetorically asked, should I accept this from your hand? And I, am I going to accept that type of offering? Verse 14, but cursed be the deceiver that has in his flock a male and takes a vow. That idea behind a vow is that you make a big deal out of it. I'm going to give, this, I'm going to give over this uh, male of my <coughs> flock. But really all it is is a religious <coughs> pretense. And then he continues, but sacrifices to the Lord what is punished. And then God says, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, he says, do not mess with me. God says, if you're going to bring me an offering, don't bring me a cripple. Don't bring me a corrupt one. In fact, it's the idea, if you're not going to bring the best, don't bring me anything. Keep it for yourself. Because you're worthy of it. But God is not worthy of it. Okay? That's an important thing to remember. That's why Christ in Revelation talks about the lukewarm church and how he's disgusted with it. He doesn't want halfway people. He wants you either to be hot so that you so that you burn for him or be cold so the world obviously knows you're not a child of God. But all those lukewarm people in the world reflect a picture to the world of Christians <coughs> that are very, very unattractive. So it's important that we see our life then, to go back to our present uh, point of conjecture, we see our life as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice to God. The Word of God says that a child of God is a priest. Everything you offer then is service to God. That's what priests did, isn't it? What was a priest's job? To minister to the Lord. They ministered to the Lord. They offered up spiritual sacrifices. And, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, they studied to show themselves approved unto man. Approved unto who? God. Approved unto God. <clears throat> when they counseled, they counseled as unto the Lord that he might be pleased. They didn't come up with counseling ideas that sound good to mankind. I had somebody approach me about, we've got, we've got, we, need, we need to be praying for members of our body that are, are being deceived by the social ills of our society. You know, this idea of your service to the Lord is so relevant to any kind of ministry. Let's say, okay, okay, let's say Jesus shows up. Jesus has just walked in the back door. Jesus is here. And he says, I want your offer. What are you going to give him? What are you going to give him? What do you have to give him? What are you prepared to give him? If he just stood there, of course, we would initially just be overwhelmed. But if he just, if he just opened his arms and he said to us, you whom I love here at New Life, I have a request of you this evening. I would like for you to bring me an offering. <coughs> Each one of them, your own offering to me. Bring me something. What would what would you bring? Would you would you get the best you had? Yes. Yes, you would. The point is, you should be getting the best you have every day. That's the point. Okay? <coughs> Give them your best. It may not be, listen, it may not be the best all the time. But give them your best. Give them the best you can do. Get rid of that dead wood in your life. 
focus on him and give him the best. And where do you start? Well, if I had been coming to New Life, if I had been here for six years, listening to Steve talk about the book of Romans, I'd start in Romans 12, 1. I'd start in Romans 12, 1, and I would say, we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our spiritual service. See? You're not doing God no you're not doing God a favor. It's your service to God. This is who we're supposed to be. This shouldn't be a leap and a bound. This should be our daily walk. And the first sacrifice he wants is God wants all of us. And when he has all of us, he is well pleased. And then it continues. He wants the praise of your lips. He wants to be the love of your life. He went, and he wants all those things, all of that to flow throughout your ministry for him. I'll give you an illustration. Wives, that do you realize that how you submit your, to your husband? And I'm just picking that one out, really. I'm not, I'm not picking that out for a special purpose. But do you understand that how you realize how you submit to your husband is a sacrifice to Jesus? <laughs> That it's an offering to him. What's Ephesians 5.22 say? Wives, submit to your husbands. And here it comes. As to the Lord. Wow. It's an offering to him, the way you submit to your husbands. Husbands, you don't get out of it. <laughs> Do you know that how you love your wife is a spiritual sacrifice to Christ? How you minister your, do you understand tonight, people of God, that how we minister our spiritual gift in the church, in the body of the Lord, is a spiritual sacrifice to Christ? How we give in terms of our offering, how we give in terms of our life, how we give in terms of our time, all of those things are a spiritual sacrifice to Jesus Christ. What are you giving him? Leftovers? Is he first and everything subsequent to him? Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, do it with your whole heart. And then it says, watch again, as unto the Lord. Again, the same idea repeat, repeated over and over and over in Scripture. Unto the Lord, not as unto men. You know, if you're, <coughs> if you're in ministry, or really any... And really any Christian that tries to do what all what people want them to do, if you try to do what everybody wants you to do, you'll be crazy. Because you know what? Everybody wants something different. It's incredible some, some Sunday mornings, the questions, queries, comments I get within 45 minutes of church starting. <laughs> and one thing I've learned over the years, and I've learned it uh, both in the military and then subsequently in the, uh, in the Christian school business, but if it's something you don't learn, it's something that can mess you up. What you have to do is rather than worrying about what people want you to do, do what God wants you to do. How can I best serve the Lord? How can I best do that? And I'll tell you, when you make up your mind and really exercise yourself in that process, it makes a big difference in your life. When you find that sweet spot and you're really being used of the Lord, 
Some of you, I can look at you right now and tell you that because you have found that sweet spot, it has made a difference in your spiritual walk. When you find that place of special service to the Lord, it builds your relationship with Him to a great degree. And you know, but, and you know I can't, we can't go around ignoring people, can we? No, we can't. But listen, what's important, when we give the right kind of spiritual service to God, I believe that the people will be affected in God's will. Okay? All right? Okay, that's enough of preaching on that. I knew I'd get stuck for a while, but... So verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, okay? <coughs> fasting. Many people ask about fasting. And I'll talk about fasting a little bit. Uh, they were fasting. What's that mean? Praying. Praying. Yeah. Almost always you find the two ideas interrelated with each other. In the Bible, fasting is almost always connected with prayer or praying in your outline. Now, don't take it wrong. Fasting is not a display where all of a sudden you say, I'm going to stop eating and I'm going to end up being spiritual. <laughs> and then you announce to everybody, uh, I'm going to stop eating so they all know that you're going to be spiritual. Now, every once in a while, if you're like me, you need to stop eating. But that has little to do with spirituality for me. It's just one of those things in our society. I do like food, and that can be a problem. But if, in the scripture, almost exclusively, fasting is always connected with prayer. My brother Randy is, uh, has been talking to me. He's going to do a, a Daniel fast. And Randy's not doing it for any reason rather than he's just trying to get closer to the Lord. Because I know Randy's heart. He's a got a special heart for the Lord. You know, uh, Jesus talked about certain evils. Uh, Jesus talked about evil spirits that would not come out by fasting and prayer. He linked those two things together. Did you know that? He talked about an evil spirit that had not come out by fasting and prayer. So fasting, I believe in a biblical concept, is tied to vigilant, passionate, prayer. And it is done so in a, in a way where an individual actually gets lost in their prayer life uh, to the point where they then really have no thought of physical food. And if there is a fact, in fact, uh, there's a book by a guy named Foster. He's a pure <coughs> Disciplines of discipleship. Boy, it's a good book. Boy, it's a good book. If you ever want to read a good book, it talks about prayer, fasting. But when, and, 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 and when you're fasting, as, if, if you do, in fact, the food, the thought of food comes to you, then you can, you can, you can pray with that thought of food. And allow that to plunge you even deeper into the spiritual realm. You may, <coughs> as you fast, you may want to devote all your time, all your effort that you do do in service to the Lord. Sometimes fasting is not premeditated at all. It just may be something that all of a sudden the Lord lays on your heart. You know, sometimes as you're involved in spiritual issues, those spiritual issues may become overwhelming and cause you to, uh, to desire to fast. In the Bible, there were, in fact, times of fasting set oftentimes in conjunction with, but outside, the feast. They would have big feasts and they would eat. Then they would have times where they didn't eat, and so on and so forth. You can see descriptions of that in the law. But in the New Testament, there's no such prescriptions, if you will. But again, let me add another thought in terms of fasting. Because <coughs> that word fasting really 
the definition of it in uh, the New Testament is is uh, very <coughs> not very elaborate. I do believe that most fasts were uh, in the New Testament context are not total fast, partial fasts, and uh, I think that oftentimes fastings were the absent absenting of oneself from banquetting. I'm not sure if that's a word, but I made it up. Banquetings. In those days, if you got bored, did you turn on the TV? Yes, Gordon. Yeah, I can attest to the truth of what you're saying about fasting. Because when I was a baby Christian, I got called to the fast. I wasn't planning for it, it just happened. And about the third day, my hunger disappeared, and I was finding myself in an attitude of constant prayer. And it was awesome. It was one of the most awesome spiritual experiences in my life. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, back in New Testament times, if they got bored, did they, <coughs> they turn on Netflix? <laughs> Go down the bowling alley? No. <clears throat> you know what their major form of entertainment was? Eating. Eating. And you know, like the Romans? The Romans got wild about eating. They would have, like, pickled hummingbird tongue. They would have all sorts of exotic and strange and crazy things at their banquets. It was a big thing. <coughs> and if you were fortunate enough to go to a banquet, you stuffed yourself. And then? And then you ate a little bit more. <laughs> you didn't have to worry about then, loosening your because, belt back then. Because the food is fun. You know, food tastes good. Have you ever been to a place where food tastes terrible? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem is after a while you, you kind of you kind of develop a taste for things. You end up eating that junk anyway. But the point of a, a partial feast, even a partial feast, is absenting, absenting yourself from indulgence. <coughs> so in some in some points of what I'm trying to say in some points of scripture. Someone might be described as being fasting, but they're still eating. They're just not overindulging. Or they may have uh, they may have developed a diet, kind of like Daniel's diet that uh, Randy's uh, getting ready to take part in. Uh, does is, do you think that Jesus endorsed the idea of fasting? Shake your head yes. We are not commanded to fast in the Bible. Now, in the Old Testament, yes, I could think, I think you could take some of that to be a command as contained in Levitical law. But in the New Testament, no. But Jesus expected us to fast. You know how I know? Because in Luke 5, uh, and I'll wrap up this fasting under this thought. Jesus said in Luke 5, in verse 33, the critics come to Jesus and what do they say? Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but your disciples, they eat and drink. It was fasting time, and John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, were fasting. <coughs> of course, the Pharisees were fasting, because everybody they wanted everybody to see they were fasting. But Jesus' disciples, they were running around eating and drinking and having a good old time. And Jesus said to them, he said, Can you make the sons of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. He said, you don't fast at a wedding, do you? The bridegroom is here. There's nothing to fast about. And then I love this part. He says, but the days will come, verse 35, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Get that? Jesus says, there's coming a time when I'll leave, and then they'll fast, because they will have spiritual battles that they need to fight, spiritual struggles, and I'm not going to be here visibly present with them, and they're going to be on their knees 
and they'll be in agony over these things. So Jesus didn't command Christians to fast. He assumed that we would fast. I'm going to ask some men in the church to begin fasting. To prepare their hearts for God's leading in their life. You know, uh, maybe we should wait until a catastrophe and then we can fast. What's that old saying? What's to dot God's What's, what's, what's God's people's last resort? Right. Prayer. When you should be God's people's first, first, first resort. You know, can you imagine if one of your children or grandchildren was at the edge of death? Then you would be willing to pass. Somebody in our, in our, in a, the life of the body of new life had a spiritual crisis in their life. There are people at New Life Family Worship that have spiritual crisis in their lives. There's kids here that have spiritual crisis in their lives. They are being torn apart by the world. <clears throat> We've got to get serious about what we're doing. I imagine uh, under spiritual stress we could all Stand fast, but let's not wait. Jesus also said in Matthew 6, he said, when you fast, don't be like the who? Don't be like them there, hypocrites. What do they do? They put on a set face. And they, they used to get that ashes and make their, their cheeks look like they were shallow. What did Jesus say about that? They mess up their hair, kind of like after I take my nap. <laughs> you want to see my hair in the morning. Jesus said about those people, what, 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 what about their reward? They already have. They already have. But he says then in Matthew 6, 17, when you fast, don't wait your head. Wash your face, he says. Get your hair combed, wash your face. Don't appear unto anybody to fast, but unto God who sees in secret and then rewards openly. The only person that needs to know when you're fasting, really, is God. If you speak to seek spiritual, spiritual counseling, of course I would know about it. But comb your hair, clean your face, praise the Lord. So these are the, these are the what we're looking at here are the early leaders, the great early leaders of the early church. These are leaders who are not only lost in the teaching of the word. We see here that they are lost in prayer and fasting. And they're doing that, these are the leaders, because they are concerned over the needs of the people they lead. And if you have that kind of leadership in a church, that church is going to be a church that makes a dent in the, in the, in the world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I pray that we might experience that in our lives here at New <clears throat> and so, with a closing thought, we've been exposed to the blueprint of the church, how our Lord designed the church. Whose church is it? He gets to design it. It's his church. He's the one that builds it. He's become, uh, he has put very process, precise processes for its building. Its growth and its operations. <coughs> and as we continue this study in the book of Acts, I hope, uh, I hope that uh, <coughs> one of the things I hope that in a iconoclastic sense, uh, iconoclastic just meaning uh, idols, uh, I hope that we're able to smash some idols about the church, if you will. I think for many years, the church through the, its filtering, through history, through <coughs> culture, the church has substituted its form for its real life. It has substituted ritual for its 
reality. The church has become an institution rather than a living organism. It has become a business instead of a Bible a body. It has become in many ways professionally a pulpitism, if you will, a man who stands behind a, pop, a, a pulpit who is sponsored by lay spectators who pay him a salary to speak to them of the things of God and make them feel good. Rather than being a ministering organism. And I hope as we study, continue to study the book of Acts, we can smash some of those old idols about the church. <clears throat> Again, having substituted its form for its real life. And I can hope, I hope we get down to some of the basics of what the New Testament church was and what the church should be today. Now we know, are there verses and texts in scripture that gives us all the form <coughs> of the church? How we ought to do this, and what time we ought to do that, and this and that, and whether we ought to have a ladies' aid society and a men's uh, fellowship, and how we ought to do this and how we ought to do that? No, there's not every form of every detail in the word, but at the same time, there are details that are basic in the terms of philosophy and ministry of the church. Time does change, but principles do not change. The word of God does not change. And the church today, obviously, the church today, to, re, to meet the expectations of God, I believe, it has to be the same and basic organism it was in the first century. Energized by the same Holy Spirit power, committed to the same Holy Spirit inspired, inspired will of God. Inspired will of God. And the church today, and I use that word church in a very broad sense, in a very general sense, because it can really miss the boat in some of these areas. And you may think that I am a critic of the church, but I believe I am not a church critic. I believe I am a church reformer. There's a bunch of critics, but the critics are those that are outside the door. The church needs reformers, not people who sit outside and condemn it, but people who are willing to come inside and help change it. And I think that's really the commission of any man of God, is to make the organized church what God intends that organism to be. And if you know as you look at the church today around the world, <coughs> Are there things you could criticize? <clears throat> yeah. There are, I would say, two extremes of the church today. There's the large religious machine type church, which is big, big business, where the church, in fact, becomes an end in itself. It exists to exist. It's really not a means to anything, it's just an end. It doesn't have as its primary goal, at least not in a working sense, teaching and winning and discipling and reproducing. It's a success is measured by the number of people that are there and the number of bodies that are briefed, baptized, blessed, and given tithing envelopes. And that's what it's all about. If I have more bodies in my building, than the guy down the street, then I'm successful, and he's not. And so you have the big business idea of church, 
which is, of course, totally foreign to the concept of an organism that's interdependent upon itself in the leading of God, a body that operates through the simplicity of the gifts of the Spirit and the responsibilities, responsibilities of fellowship. We're responsible to each other in our fellowship. On the other hand, on the other extreme, you have the social reform view of church in present day America. That the church isn't really to preach the word of God. The, per the church should be solving problems of economics and politics and civil <coughs> and social and environmental struggles. And truly the pastors and leaders in those church are as lost as, as any heathen in the world. Only thing is they're more damned, the Bible says, because they're sin willfully, they sin willfully against God and are in fact false prophets. I'm not a critic. I'm a reformer. They are, they are preoccupied, if you will, with civil issues. There's no reality to their theology if they, if they can't believe the word of God, if you can't really nail down who Jesus is, and you can't be firm on the fact of who Jesus is, then the only thing you have left is men. If you're not going to major on Jesus, who are you going to major on? Men. People. And so that's what happens. I read an article in U.S. News and World Report. How many of you know of U.S. News and World Report? Been around for a long time. I don't think they print anymore. As far as I know, they're an online entity only. <clears throat> and I'll Google, I'll Google something like Young Minister Surveys. Blah, here comes all this information. So I was looking at an article in U.S. News and World Report, and it says that young pastors and ministers, the article says, are calling on our churches to save the individual. That sounds good to me. Save the individual. But the problem is it goes on. And it says that the majority of these young pastors and ministers believe that you can save the individual by reforming society, by dealing with the ills of urbanization, technology, and discrimination. <coughs> Where have they got that idea? Seminary. Can you say seminary? Cemetery. <laughs> That's, their, that's what they believe, Sally Cox, if you ever believe anything like that, I'll smack you upside the head. <laughs> they believe that that's what will make religion relevant in today's world. Re beloved, that will make religion obsolete in today's world. That's not what we are to do. Yes, ultimately, we should minister to the total man in every way, yes. But the church preoccupied with social ills of the church that has had the gospel vacuumed out of it and sunk and stuck in a drawer somewhere. And I reject the idea that the church is a reformed institution for the world. I think the church is a reformed institution for one man at a time on the basis of Jesus Christ. And then those individuals will go forth and they will change the world. And you're not going to change society any other way. We've been trying to do it for a long time and it hasn't worked. The only way you will change men is through the gospel, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I don't reject the modern church. I'm not going to throw away the baby the dirty bath water. There are things that are wrong, but that does not mean that we eliminate the whole thing. There's two reasons why I don't want to fight the church. Well, I want to be a reformer and not a critic. <coughs> Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't want to fight that battle. So we can't win that battle. Jesus will build his church. 
Jesus is building his church. And we need to do everything we, we can to teach the word of God and make it what it ought to be. It all boils down to just working with each other, doesn't it? Because who is the church? 